good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here and to present you my whole experience. I tr I'll try. Like over 10 years of Android development, uh, so I'm going to try to do a, a retrospective of that time. Uh, quick intro about myself. Uh, so I'm Julian Salvi. I'm a lead Android engineer at Aircall based in Paris. Uh, I'm an Android GD. I'm part of the Paris Android user group and I'm listening to punk music and drinking IPA beers on the side. Uh, if you want like, to, to follow some Android stuff, you can follow me on uh, Twitter at Julian Salvi. Okay, so first, I want to do like a bit of disclaimer. So it will be about Android, of course. Uh, it will be based on my personal ex experience as a developer. I show how Android dev has evolved through time, like with from 2008, from today. Um, I'll show you some Android dev samples, some bad, some very bad, some nice. Um, I'll try to make this talk a bit interactive. So uh, when you see some slide, I'll tell you, uh, like you are going to go online and enter a code and something like that. And you're gonna vote for something, spoiler. So this will be all about this, but I won't talk about how Android was born. Chet has did it perfectly with its book and uh, also uh, some keynotes. And I won't cover all the things that happened during the Android dev time. Uh, it was too much for like 50 minutes, so sorry if I don't go like to all the details, but I choose my topic. Or you're gonna choose it. Okay, so 10 years of Android development. Let's set up the context. Well, or as we used to say, a little bit of like context for us. Uh, so sometimes uh, for 10 years, uh, I feel a bit like this. Sometimes it's a bit like this, but most of the time it was like this. Uh, a lot of focus learning through like uh, the, the first line of code uh, I wrote for Android was like end of when, 2010, end of 2010, beginning of 2011, uh, was a student, a lot of learnings, internships, first jobs, and so on. So, this is me, this is my face, should be the same as this one. Uh, so I started with Android Froyo uh, back in the days. Then, uh, mostly work for startups, so uh, the team I was on, sometimes it was ju just me, two people, or like, max five, six people. So I begin with Eclipse. It was not fun, but it worked. With our good old friend Java, then use a couple of tools like Action Bar Sherlock, Crashlytics when it was independent, then it went to Twitter and then Firebase. Uh, use Butterknife like to uh, bind views. It was nice back then. Android annotation, it was uh, also cool back then. And then used like to use the, the modern stack with Kotlin, Android Studio, and now Jetpack Compose. So all of this, this is my experience. And uh, I try like to, to come up with some retrospective, like to say, okay, uh, from 2010 to now, uh, let's see what I can tell, and uh, there's a lot of things. But first, let's see how we went from this, this was the Android portal, like in 29, to this. Or how we went from this, like Eclipse and the good old emulator, to Android Studio and the emulator in the studio. Or how we went from this, to a brand new pixel. Uh, but first, I said the talk will be interactive, so if you have the kindness to go to menti.com and enter this QR code, there will be like just a tiny question. I'm gonna let 
just a bit if you want to scan the, the QR code. A simple question, what was your first Android version when you started Android development? And it should be live. Okay, lots of KitKats. Froyo. Oh, with numbers. Three. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good old days. Oreo, Marshmallow. Okay, so a lot of Froyo, KitKat, Gingerbread. Okay, so you probably will know <laughs> all the crazy stuff like we used to have, like Action Bar Sherlock and so on. So you won't be lost and be afraid of like crazy Java sample, bad sample actually. Okay. So back in the slides now. Okay. So let's dig a bit into into the subject. So I come up with a timeline. So when Android was born in 2028, like the first version to now. So we've been like from Android 1, uh, Android 1 1.5, I put it here because it's the birth of Asyntask. Uh, then Android 3 was the, um, the birth of Holo, then like a uh, few major like Android 5 for material design, Android 6 for permission. I put Android 9 here because it's the end of the dessert thing. Pretty bad. Uh, so after after Pi, no dessert for us, fortunately. And then we come up with Android 11 and 13 now. So like all these versions, how our experience as, a, as an Android developer evolved. So it was a bit like this. So at the beginning, we had like Eclipse, ADT, and Java to build our applications, and then uh, the ecosystem evolved like with the Android community and thanks to Google. So at the beginning, not so much from Google like to enable us as a developer like to, to build high quality apps, but it does something like uh, at the end, like uh, 2011, 2012, we have the, the action bar, fragment, all the design that, that came up with like all, like few support libraries from Google and a lot of things from the community, uh, like Action Bar Sherlock to be uh, backward compat with, uh, with older version, uh, Rx Java, uh, like till the uh, Marshmallow, we have Butter Knife, Tiger, Retrofit, so all the, the tool set by, uh, by Square and by Jack Wharton. Uh, I think like uh, he, he made like <laughs> the entire community stuff back then, like between 2012 to 2015, a lot of library we are using even right now came from Square and Jack Wharton. Uh, Vode actually in 2013, uh, still supported by the way, uh, by Google. Uh, then we had like some uh, new, new thing, like Android thing, uh, Chromecast, uh, TV and so on, so where and then. So uh, it evolved, uh, we drop my clips, we have a nice uh, Android Studio blazed, blazed on the IntelliJ ID. And then uh, we see, we saw that Android ecosystem like was much more focused on quality, privacy, security from Android 6 to now. Uh, so. Google started like to, to build like some very great tool for us and actually added much more restriction and like to, for the user, but it was a bit of a pain for us. So uh, runtime permission, those mode, uh, I put like in, the, in 2017, so it was the rise of Kotlin, architecture component with Umodern and so on. And then started with the Google I.O. 2019. Uh, Google announced that it was Kotlin first. So uh, then we saw the rise of Compose, uh, the end of the support library for the Jetpack ecosystem. And like we love fragmentation. So yeah, uh, <laughs> many libs uh, to, to explore with, uh, with Jetpack. Uh, the end of the ascent task. 
it was nice, actually. Uh, then Compose and Kotlin multi-platform, and then here we are. So this is like a snapshot of like a, a timeline of like oh, uh, 15 years, almost. So this timeline, I wanted like to split it in three. So first, at the beginning, like from Android One to uh, to Lollipop, then from Lollipop to Kotlin, and then Kotlin from to now. And I wanted like to split it that way uh, and name. So it was the Yolo Age, or the Yolo Age. Then we end up like in the material age, and then now we are right in the Kotlin, K, in Kotlin age, or the K age, or the cage to be a uh, bit more simpler. Okay, so uh, through this talk, I'm gonna go through some topics about all these ages, eras. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna come up with some uh, retrospective about Action Bar. How we build native UI from the yellow age to the cage. Uh, our network calls was made, uh, a bit of architecture, how it evolved, our scrolling content evolved through time, background work and permissions. Uh, I probably won't do it all, uh, just because I want you just to go again on menti.com, enter this code, and uh, actually you're gonna choose uh, the content I'll be speaking about. So if you, I'll let you a few seconds to scan the QR code. And then uh, please choose the topic you are the most interested in. Architecture, I was sure. <laughs> so obvious. Okay. Uh, let you a few seconds. Architecture, background work, build native UI. Okay. <laughs> Not so much about permission. <laughs> okay. Okay, so architecture first, then background work, build native UI, and then I end up with the rest. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so first, architecture. One does not simply implement in architecture on Android. At first, I cannot say we implemented the AITA or the AITF. All in the activity or all in the fragment. Uh, back in 2010, I was a student and I was pushing all the code in the activity, no matter what, and even sometimes now I'm doing for, for POC, but yeah. don't follow the, the rule. Please, don't do that. Uh, you can end up with a crazy long file. Uh, it's not very interesting. You cannot maintain it. Uh, you cannot test it. You, uh, yeah. Please don't do that, really. Uh, we used to do that like back then. We don't have a lot of documentation. I was young. Yeah, so please, please don't ever do that. And then the Hype, like uh, I learned a bit of ar architecture, and then the, the hype was focused on the uh, some of MVC con uh, context, so model view controller. Uh, have a bit of separation of concerns, uh, so the user input were handled by the controllers. And for sure, do not put business logic in view components. That was the rule, and is still the rule. Uh, so it's very important not to put business logic in views. So, uh, 
was represented a bit like this. Uh, so the controller was the activity, we, like handled all the user inputs, then it talks to views and all some models. Um, it was, you can end up like using MVC, MVC with like a bad architecture like I showed you before, uh, or you, you can like uh, separate all the things like uh, keep things in activity, then use your data layer on the side uh, with your model and, and implement your view again on the side with uh, fragments, views, and so on. Um, okay, then the hype reached the MVP status. Uh, not for most valuable product, but for the model view presenter now. Uh, again, we keep the separation of concern and like have an idea of an abstraction for, for your archi architecture. Um, and now the user input are handled by the view. And then, as a rem kind reminder, do not put business logic in view components. So uh, activities, fragment, and edit text button, all your, all your views, and especially uh, the difference between the MVC and the MVP. It's like the activity stuff went to view, and it's actually a view component. So the user input went uh, to the view, and then the view uh, was in touch with the presenter, and the presenter was fetching the, the data in the data layer through some data manager and so on. Uh, and then, uh, the data, the data layer send back the, the data you want to the presenter, and the presenter notify the view, and the view display uh, like the, the new UI stuff. Uh, it was like like this MVP was quite popular, like uh, like 2014, 15. Well, the, uh, like before Android push for MVVM. Um, all the architecture component, like uh, it was, it, it's now like recommended to use it, but you don't have to follow it. Okay, so MVVM for model view model, model view view model, I forgot a view. So again, you have to keep in mind when you do some architecture, keep the separation of concerns. Um, you can use abstraction, and not must, but it's nice. Uh, yeah, MVVM uh, was part of the architecture guide, so Google introduced uh, in 2017, something like that. Uh, and they push a lot of libraries for that, uh, view model, love data, and uh, a lot of documentation how like, to start like Android development, but with a notion of architecture. So, uh, not going YOLO at first, but so now you, you have some like documentation and you can start uh, with, with some knowledge and build a nice app. Uh, yeah, it was like this. So uh, almost the same as the, the, view present, uh, the MVP concept. Uh, so the view model fetched the data in the data layer. So we have your repository, data source, and so on. So pretty st straightforward. Uh, so speaking of data layer, uh, you can also use the repository pattern. Uh, now it's widely used. So it's an abstraction of the data layer here. And again, keep the separation of concerns uh, and in order to have a single source of truth. So you can end up using this kind of representation, like uh, you have your user repository, which, in, which is talking to Maybe, maybe other repository, and then this repository will fetch data through uh, some maybe remote data source, local data source, uh, cache data source, and so on. And then uh, you have also some concept of clean architecture. Uh, well, clean-ish architecture, as I used to say, because you don't apply clean architecture by the book. Uh, you can, you can take inspiration for sure, uh, but it's not necessarily useful like to follow the thing by the book. Uh, so again, have a clean architecture, clean architecture concept allow you to have like the separation of concerns, and you've seen that a lot because it's very important for architecture and developing like software in general. Like keep things separate, like enable abstraction, and for sure like to the code to be testable. So as I said, uh, don't follow 
by the book, take some inspiration and uh, make things work working for you. So uh, you got this kind of presentation. So uh, presentation talk to your use case, which we end up like using some uh, domain stuff, and then uh, do that again back. And then you can use also the MVWU way W. Or we, maybe. Uh, the model view, what you want, actually. Uh, but just keep the separation of concerns. Have some abstraction, which enable maintainability for your code and testability. And of course, do not put business logic in view component. Please. So I was talking about retrospective, so took inspiration for our, like, Retrospective, we are using to do in the AI world. So put a go, think, explore, and for architecture, uh, like my 10 years experience was like, depends. And it depends uh, a lot on the context, your app, how it bigs. Uh, if you, you start this from, from scratch, you end up uh, to an, a new, uh, to, um, to an app that is already existing. It really, it really depends, uh, but uh, keep in mind the most important, like separation of concern, stability, maintainability for, for a healthy project. Okay, so then it was about background work, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so let's, talk a bit about background one and how it evolved uh, from Android 1 to 13. So at first, uh, when the API 1 was released, uh, so fully in Java, so we had to use some Java primitive and Java concepts. So the, the first thing you can end up like for you know, doing some background work was the Java spread. Pretty simple, efficient, but and uh, not very life cycle aware. Uh, so you can end up like uh, implementing your own renewable or your own thread, you start to spread, and uh, when you want like to notify the UI, you can use like these three APIs uh, that are available since the API one, so run on your UI thread or uh, post uh, the renewable or post delays if you want to introduce some delays. Uh, with the data you computed. Uh, so classic, classic Java, I would say. Uh, you can also use executors. And actually, I, when I uh, wrote the site and I dig a bit into executors, because it's been a long time since I, I, I've used it, all these are things that are available since, on, uh, since the API 1. And some concepts, actually, uh, are pretty similar to coroutines. And you'll see, like, okay, I am, but I define the executor, execute my task and my task. Uh, can be submit, so it's a callable stack, uh, callable task, and it results in a future. And to get the data, uh, you, you call uh, future.get, and it's actually blocking method. So you see the concept and the, uh, the thing like with coroutines, suspending function, blocking function, and uh, the executor. So it, it was back then, like uh, 13 years ago. Uh, I think we have some pretty similar context, um, concept. So executors are, was nice and still nice, actually. Uh, have useful factories, utilities method, uh, it's you have much more configurable options uh, than the Java thread. So uh, you can end up like uh, uh, defining your own thread pool and so on. So this is usable since API 1. And then also with API 1, uh, services, Android services was introduced like to perform long running operation in background or in foreground. Uh, uh, intent service was nice like to launch things and maybe forget about it. Uh, but it is now deprecated because uh, services like 
Google put like a lot of restriction through time. Like it was a bit open bar before. Like uh, you can end up trigger something in the background, not taking care of the battery usage, the, uh, the user data, the whatever. Uh, so on the side, it's very nice for the user, the device, and the ecosystem. But in it introduces a lot of work on our side, like to uh, work with services. But it's still very useful, like uh, to to go with services. Uh, and then, I think you all waited for that. The async task. Uh, it's more like the the most popular thing to do background work back then. I think it, it, yeah, it lasted for from API three, and it was deprecated at last in API 30. Uh, but it has some drawbacks, so can leak across configurations, change, uh, like no lifecycle aware component. So don't use them anymore. It was nice like to, to process some ba background stuff. You were able like, to publish some progress, uh, for example, if, if you were implementing a downloading task and so on. Uh, it worked, it was nice. Uh, the, like, the implementation is, itself was not a nightmare, uh, but we are now, now used with so much better stuff. <laughs> uh, or we can use, like back then, Android annotation, uh, like when it was like the rise of like annotating all the things on Android. Uh, so add background and add, add UI thread to like to bit of bit of a magic here with Android annotation like to 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 hide the concept of uh, async task. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then uh, at the end of the Yolo age and the beginning of the Material age, uh, Java Eric came up like and spread in the entire Android ecosystem, uh, like from Eric. One to Rx three, uh, so it was pretty nice. Like no callback error, linear logic, so you can like do ch like chain operations, map, zip, complete, and so on. Uh, like you can like subscribe on the iOS thread and push uh, your computation on the main thread. Uh, so it was it was nice, not trivial for the learning curves. Uh, uh, yeah, it was a bit difficult at the beginning, um, but it was efficient. Uh, but uh, on the bad side of the thing, uh, when the, the community ended up like using a lot RS, Rx Java, uh, there was like Rx all the things, like uh, uh, putting some Rx Java in views, uh, data layer, uh, f like all everywhere. Uh, the temptation was high. But once you stick like to push Eric Java from the view layer to the data layer, it's hard like to go back and like experiment other things. The migration is a long road. The beginning is was meh. Uh, uh, yeah, need some tricks like to be fully life cycle aware. And uh, then uh, through times we got nice uh, library from uh, from Google uh, with the, the Jetpack libraries. So we had the work manager we still use and maintain. So it's the recommended solution for, for persistent work. Uh, if you want like to do some immediate work, deferable work or long running. Uh, so uh, can be like a replacement for the old alarm manager, uh, job scheduler and so on. Um, but it has a robust scheduling and many configuration options. So, uh, and you see the, the API is, is it's, up. It's, it's pretty nice. Like uh, configuration is okay. Uh, you can schedule run task uh, like every X minutes or every X hours. Um, it reduces a lot of uh, possibilities for, for that. And then we end up at the end of the material age and at the beginning of the cage, uh, the coroutines. Uh, fully in Kotlin, it's a Kotlin API, and you can take advantage uh, of that if you're using Kotlin. Uh, this is the recommended way to do background work. 
So uh, it has a solid and robust trading system uh, with scopes, jobs, and supervisor. Uh, it can trigger lightweight uh, thread, fewer memory leaks, consolidation support, and Jetpack integration. So uh, now we are in the Kotlin age. If you want to do some background work like right away, use Coroutines. The API is nice, no callback L. Uh, you can switch context, go to the main thread, IO thread, default thread, whatever. Um, the multi-threading is nice. I don't like, I won't talk a lot about uh, flow, uh, still experimental, uh, but it, it would be like a nice replacement for Eric's Java. Uh, so, the Kotlin ecosystem has a lot to offer and still will offer a lot of things like to, to make our job a bit more easier. So, about background work, uh, the big thing like multi-spreading multi is very not easy. I should have made a typo. Uh, so for the Go, if you are using Kotlin, go with coroutines for sure. Uh, services are a bit more strict uh, now but still very useful uh, for long running tasks. Uh, and of course, if you want to schedule some background work, use the, the work manager. Uh, forget about async task. Uh, it's now deprecated, so please, if you have some in your code, please migrate. Uh, from the beginning, I was not a fan of Eric Java. Sorry if, he, if there is some uh, fan of Rx here. Uh, but I still didn't, did, don't like it so much. <laughs> uh, and then uh, things to explore, like um, using some Kotlin flows, uh, mutable flow, and so on, and so like that, to have some reactive programming with Kotlin, uh, give it a try to, to flow. Okay, so that was it for the background work. I don't. Uh, uh, and then it was uh, uh, build native UI. Okay. So I'm gonna give you my point of view about that. Uh, so how we built native UI from uh, the yellow age to the brand new Kotlin and Compose thing we are using right now. Um, Okay, from the first view components to compose, uh, and how the community com contributed like to a better developer experience for, for us. Um, uh, I'll try like to answer how the developer experience has evolved over time. So here is the, the long journey to compose from XML and Java to Kotlin and compose. So let's start with the dark age. At the beginning, not many possibilities, not many components, but many possibilities. Uh, like, it was a bit wild. <laughs> uh, not so many things on sample and tooling from Google. So most of them, it was by hand. So you had the activity, you had the views, view group, linear, uh, frame layout. Absolutely, yeah, would. Uh, so at the beginning, uh, <laughs> this is my code. Like, uh, if you go to the to the GitHub page, uh, please don't look. It's very bad code. Um, so you define your button, you inflate your views, find view by ID. Uh, it looks like the good old days, extending the, like creating custom views. So extend a view, surface view, so on. Uh, implementing all the, uh, the constructor, maybe overriding the canvas thing. Yeah, yeah, it was all by the end. And then you go to the XML, define your all good XML, like uh, some uh, attributes we are not using anymore, like field parent, uh, like 50 DIP, not DP. Uh, uh, it was like, Back then, I did some very bad code with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was introduced in API 1, and 
directly deprecated in API 3. So it lasted like three versions. So like well, two versions. Uh, uh, do not do that at all. So don't do use don't use ever absolute layout. Um, so it it there like to <laughs> uh, put components like in a an absolute way in pixel. So like, okay, I'm gonna put like these components from the top, uh, the, the right uh, left corner, no, left top corner. Uh, so put my position like X, Y uh, in pixel. Uh, for sure, and like if you were using that, you would end up like to have some trouble with all the um, uh, density and all the phones. Okay, still in the dark ages, uh, supporting multiple docency wasn't so trivial. Uh, we had to support multiple assets. Uh, so we end up like with the uh, folder, LDPI, MDPI, HDPI, and the maximum back then it was like X HDPI, not like triple X for now. We have like really, really big phone now. Uh, then no SVG, so uh, we had the good old nine patch, uh, like to make the the content a bit stretch, uh, like uh, for like maybe text buttons, uh, custom background. Uh, you can end up like also building your own drawable like by XML or using your the the nine patch. It was a thing. It worked. It was nice. But now we have so much better tooling. Then came uh, after the, the dark age, the all age. So Honeycomb introduces uh, the first kind of design system with Holo design, brand new designs, so new components. And this was the rise of the fragment and the support libraries. It was some kind of the design system, so here is like what it looks like back in the days. Uh, although when the supporting of the the tablets and so on, like you with the fragments, you have all these like thing main detail uh, samples uh, using fragment. Uh, it was brand new. Uh, then fragment like. It was a bit crazy for, for us. I mean, we experienced a lot of issues with them. Uh, but we were using them. Uh, you, we were using Fragment, even if we had a lot of critics. So maybe we are a bit masochist. I don't know. Uh, then more support libraries. <coughs> Not a lot, but enough like to uh, build some back one, back, backward uh, backward compatibility apps, uh, and also it was the rise of the community. Uh, like uh, middle F end of the YOLO age, uh, so lots of tools were introduced, uh, butter knife, and relay annotation, action bar Sherlock, even bus. And even I, I was thinking like this morning, uh, at the beginning, just like displaying uh, a photo, an image, we were like getting by uh, by the network without Picasso, Glide, or something like that. Ah, it was it was very very painful. And starting with that, the our developer experience very increased. So here is an example uh, like using butter knife. Uh, it was nice like uh, annotation everywhere. Uh, it, it was the thing like to to put annotation. All the, all, all the way. Uh, so bind view, you bind your resources, like you bind your string, you, uh, you bind your on click, and so on. So it, it was a pretty nice, uh, pretty nice experience in that, and the, the developer experience was pretty good with that. Uh, for exp uh, example, also uh, in read annotation, more annotation. Uh, so binding also the views, uh, resources, uh, doing some background work, etc. and so on. Like a bit more tooling than butter knife, or uh, you can use the <laughs> even bus. Actually, I got uh, if you go to the repository, it's still maintained after two to ten years. 
I don't know if many of you still using it, but you can. It was like a bit YOLO back then, like to trigger whatever event listening in the main thread, in outside the, the thread. So it was, uh, it was a bit messy, but it worked. Right? It was very useful. And the, uh, like the, the, the interface and the, um, the API, it's very straightforward and easy to use. That's why like, you can end up like to maybe sometimes very messy things. And then uh, we end up like in the material age. Uh, so you have this nice UI. So after material was announced, uh, Google pushed a lot of things uh, to make it like backward compatible. Uh, it was like the, the golden age of the, the support library, the V7 with uh, app compat, card use, uh, recycler view, lean back, and so on. And we had a new concept, not backward com compatible, the uh, elevation. Uh, it was nice, brand new. You can set up your own elevation uh, for, for Lollipop and so on. Uh, it brings like some nice UI stuff, uh, but you had like to find a workaround for KitKat and before. And then, like, yeah, in the, the golden age of, uh, of mater material, uh, people, uh, Google started like to push more and more support language. They understand like they, they need to provide a lot of tooling maintained by them, like to push high quality contents. So we end up like with constraint layout, architecture component, and material design library, which enable us like without a huge knowledge of design concept uh, to build nice apps. Uh, yeah, so it allows us like many capabilities with uh, with that. Like Constraint Layout was a very nice way to like maybe ditch uh, the the relative layout, which was like a bit um, bit much more consuming on the Android uh, on the Android side. So yeah, uh, it was pretty nice. Uh, and then we end up to the rise of Kotlin. And so we love fragmentation. So the support libs are dead, long live Android X libraries. So Jetpack brings a lot of things, a lot of, uh, lot of libraries to, to investigate on and use. Uh, so Google invested a lot uh, on the developer experience with that. Uh, some was nice, some was not. Especially data bending. Uh, when I introduced that in my old code base, at first it was like, oh, nice, uh, can put some logic in the in XML. Uh, and I then was like, why I di did I put logic in the XML? Like, <laughs> maybe it was the hype, but yeah, it was not something I would do again. <laughs> um, Moving to Kotlin help a lot, like to move from like this concept. Uh, so now with Kotlin and Compose, uh, Compose was very game changer for for the UI development on Android, like new concept, declarative UI, functional programming, and so on. So new paradigms, new concepts. It's the XML sunset. Uh, we will go full Kotlin ahead. So it will enable us like to build efficient code. Uh, uh, doing something like this, like uh, no XML, few lines of code, uh, can enable us like to, to be to build much more better app uh, and focus on the right thing. So, a bit of uh, retrospective now uh, on the go. Uh, the the tooling at the beginning was not so great, but it getting better and better uh, every year. Uh, if you have the, the the right stack you know, using Kotlin and you can move to Compose, go for it. But never forget the view system. Uh, it's core to Android. Uh, do not forget the, the concept of the, the view system. Uh, the thing I will ditch, uh, like move away from Kotlin synthetics, uh, it's gonna be deprecated. And it's already deprecated, but it's gonna be removed very soon. It was nice, but uh, yeah. Uh, we have to say goodbye to content analytics. Uh, stop using data binding, please. Uh, time to say goodbye to our good old XML. 
Um, Compose is still new, so go for it and explore. Uh, also go uh, speak to people, the community of fundraisers, awesome, and the community is building a lot of great stuff. Uh, do I have still some time to, maybe, maybe, yes. Okay, yes, nice. Uh, let's see, uh, ah, the scrolling content was a nice one. Okay, <laughs> let's see how scrolling content evolved through, through time. And let's see me scrolling. Okay, so scrolling content, it's fundamental on mobile UX. Uh, from the beginning to now, uh, scrolling is very fundamental. You cannot have a fixed screen on your device. Uh, you can end up like doing some very bad UX experimentation uh, on mobile. So we add some components at the beginning with the API one, scroll view, list view, uh, allows infinite or finite scrolling content. But how easy and performant were uh, these components uh, on Android? And how these components evolved through time. So at first, like we had, like we are still using the, the scroll view. If you are stick to the view system, so available in the API one, you have to put only one directional in your scroll view, and then you add view to your controller to to your container, like to to display a lot of things that maybe go bigger than your your screen. And that's it. At the beginning, API one uh, was pretty much it. Like you add things to the container, uh, and yeah, nothing else. No scroll listener. Well, not directly. Uh, it was a bit hacky. So you had to extend the scroll view, listening, the on scroll change, getting the third child to say, okay, compute it yourself or uh, putting a view tree observer uh, to the, the, the scroll view and listening the scroll change. Uh, like the developer experience was not so great, but then uh, starting like from API 1 to API 23, we have the official support from like a scroll listener to get the actual offset like X or Y uh, during your scroll view. And then it was backported with uh, the nested scroll view. And this was like, uh, yeah, right in the, the material age. So at the beginning it was like, eh, uh, not so much animation, I would say, with a scroll view. And then we end up with Compose, so it allows you like to enable scrolling content very easily with Compose. Just using the vertical scroll or horizontal scroll modifier, quick setup and support the nested scrolling. So you define your column, your row, whatever, and you just put like vertical scroll and you are good to go. You can listen uh, and remember the, the, scroll the scroll state. So uh, getting the, the offset position and so on. Uh, so <laughs> from the, uh, the scroll view to now, uh, it, it's been a long way. Uh, and then there was the list view at the beginning. Since the API one, infinite and as free efficient scroll listener, but lots of boilerplate, like a lot. It was so painful like to implement some swipe animation or get the scroll position uh, and you had to implement your own view holder pattern back then. And I'm not talking about grid view. It was a, uh, again a <laughs> much more painful. Uh, so you define your list in the, in the XML, define your adapter, uh, define your view, uh, then define uh, you set up your adapter, set my list, and then whatever the set, notify data set change. Like whatever, if you have a thousand, uh, like a thousand item in your list, notify them all. Like it's good for performance. Uh, then uh, Google understood that it was not so efficient and so on. So they introduced like um, a better thing with recycler view. 
It was released uh, back then in 2014 in the support library V21. Uh, it, it has a nice tooling. Uh, it was much more flexible and performant than the list view to display a large set of data. Uh, and it, was, it supports horizontal and vertical scrolling. But yeah, as we see, still a lot of boilerplate, like defining the recycler view, defining the editor. Uh, if you want like, to implement a diff callback or implement like uh, multiple selection and so on, you can end up writing a lot of code uh, just for handling like on the user end some trivial stuff. Yeah, lots of boilerplate still. Uh, performant, but still a lot of boilerplate. But now, in the cage, uh, lazy list with compose uh, is so much better. Like you can end up like uh, removing maybe 70% of your code uh, with recycler adapter, defining your XML and so on. So you probably like will cut like 60 to 70% of your code to have like a, an efficient uh, and performant uh, infinite scroll with the lazy column or lazy row. So Compose introduced lazy column, lazy row, and vertical grid. Uh, no more XML, no more adapter, and we have three. Uh, so performant, but there are still room for improvements and they are working on it. So for the story, uh, move to Compose and use the lazy list. Uh, it, you will save <laughs> a lot of uh, uh, of your life, like writing some uh, adapters, list, and so on. Uh, stop using list view. Uh, adapter was very complicated, like to maintain sometimes with multiple like items and so on. Animation was not straightforward with uh, with list view, uh, either with recycler view, uh, even if it was a bit better, but still not the optimal stuff um, as an exploration part like keep going with recycler uh, if you want to use the view system but if you want like to move to com to if you have a Kotlin ecosystem in your app move to compose uh, and uh, do, 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 uh, think, uh, do we have time uh, or maybe not Maybe. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I can stop if you want. Huh? Uh, I can set up another uh, poll thing. Uh, yeah, yes, no, continue, stop. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see a bit of network calls. Oh, no. Permission. It was uh, the thing you don't want to see, so I, I go with permissions. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, let's see how it used to be. So at the beginning, uh, you permission adverse since the beginning of, uh, of Android. So it allowed the app like to access sensible feature or data. Uh, we must declare them in the manifest. And of course, the most famous permission. Uh, there's a there's not a day without a tweet about that. Like, oh no, I forgot my internet permission. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Every time, every time. Uh, so yeah, declare them in the manifest. So go on your manifest, define uh, your permission, internet, Bluetooth, so on. Uh, but back then, the user had really no power to reject the permission. So I saw some application putting like some crazy shit permission, like. Uh, declaring Bluetooth, but they didn't use any Bluetooth stuff. Uh, access location, but we didn't, didn't use any location stuff. And so on, like, well, okay, I can access the, your call phone, I can uh, make a phone call, but I don't want you to make some phone call. Uh, please don't. I'm gonna like, remove your application. Uh, so, well, you had the power like, to use all the permission for free on the developer side. Uh, on the user side, <laughs> it can be a bit, uh, bit tricky. So at the beginning, we said, yeah, you get a permission, you get a permission. Yeah, yeah everybody gets a permission. Uh, it was a bit of uh, an open bar back then. 
but then the open bar ended with the API 24. Uh, now permission must be granted by the user uh, to use sensible feature on data. So different kind of level, normal permission, you can use it right away, no need to ask the user, dangerous permission, now you have to ask the user if we can use this kind of sensible feature. So, and everything must be asked at runtime. So, as usual, you define your permission in the manifest, so internet, normal permission, no need to, to request at runtime, but if you uh, were or are using the, for example, the, the read contact permission, now you have to ask the user if uh, they give you the permission like to read the context in your app. So, uh, but then it was like this implementation, so we check if uh, the permission is granted or not, then we display, uh, we let the, the activity system display the, the dialogue to say, okay, uh, this application wants to access the contact allow uh, or uh, reject the permission. And then, uh, when you ask it, you have to listen the result, so if it has been granted or not in the on-request permission result. Uh, the, then with the like evolution of our developer experience, Google push a lot of things with app compat and so on, and they rethink a bit the, the API about like asking permissions. Um, even through time, permission uh, has like, much more restriction than before uh, because Google focused a lot of, on privacy and security. Uh, some not bar permission when dangerous uh, and some of them when deprecated. Uh, so all the APIs are now deprecated uh, and we have some new like uh, new API with Android X and Jetpack. Uh, so for that, uh, now we just like need to register a callback, a request permission, so register for activity result. So you end up like using a, a launcher, uh, like to check it. Uh, you like check if the permission is already good to go, or if we should ask uh, a rational dialogue to the user, or um, if I need to request the permission, I'm gonna use the launcher to launch, uh, to, to request actually this permission. And there is no uh, like uh, unresolved thing uh, that needs to be stick to the activity or the fragment. So you're gonna listen if the permission is granted or not uh, like in the, in the callback, in the permission callback. Uh, so yeah, you end the like your, uh, with this dialogue and so on. So permission have also through time evolved outside the application. User can now disable them from the device settings, uh, things that was not possible back then. And then starting with Android 11, some permission can be temporarily granted or, or for unused apps. Uh, uh, apps can reset all the permission if it's uh, in a state mode for like uh, three months or so. Uh, so yeah, uh, like my feedback about permission, like uh, take a look at the, the library you are using. Uh, some third party may embed, it, may embed some permission you don't want. Uh, be careful with the permission you are using. Uh, stop using random permission. It's not no more possible now in the modern uh, Android world. Uh, do not forget internet permission or you are gonna end up in a tweet. Uh, new permission APIs, uh, not optimal I would say, uh, but it, it's not more stick to the activity stuff. So uh, in a way, it's nice. On the other side, it's a callback. So uh, there is some bad, some good. Uh, yeah, so be user-centric and security-centric. So use permission very carefully. Uh, continue stuff, no. 
uh, I can continue for hours, but uh, I think we can be late on the schedule. Uh, so I think I'm going to wrap up here. Okay. If you want like to have uh, some uh, glimpse of the past, uh, you the web archive org. Like uh, I went a lot through this uh, tool, like to get some information that was archived, like for Android one, two, three. Crazy samples. Uh, like go and check the Android Google source. Check the Android developer. Uh, blog, uh, there are plenty of uh, archive stuff uh, for the Holo and Material uh, Age. And there's a nice Twitter, like Android History, like if you have some nostalgia about the old Android UI. And grazie mille, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy it. <laughs>